uh, organized by uh, between uh, INRA A and Robagri. And uh, this team today is uh, the accessible robotics uh, for ensuring the agricultural transition to make it uh, possible. And uh, we're going to try today to exchange some uh, last uh, advances in terms of uh, research and development in order to be usable for farmers. And uh, to this end, uh, the Robagri Association is leading uh, this workshop and is uh, working uh, a lot um, using uh, developing uh, sharing tools uh, to permit uh, the innovation between uh, research, um, constructor, and farmer. So I let uh, Stéphane Durand introduce uh, in a few minutes uh, Robagri Association. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Roland. Uh, welcome to the fourth um, uh, scientific, uh, scientific uh, forum uh, organized by Robagri and uh, Inrae. I'm Stefan Duran, so uh, project manager for uh, Robagri. Um, so I'm going to give a quick uh, introduction to, the, uh, to what we do in the, um, in the association. And then we'll come back to it at the end of the, uh, of the day at five. Okay, so um, we, I'm going to talk about the association which was uh, founded uh, five years ago uh, to the initiative to uh, INRAE ex IRSTEA and AXEMA. Um, we had as chairman a strong involve involvement of uh, Kuhn Company uh, with uh, chairman Jean-Michel Lebars then uh, actually uh, uh, Christophe Aubier from uh, Agrin uh, Culture. And what is special about us is that we try to, that we, we do uh, link together uh, different uh, sectors from the former to research and uh, industry. So what is key to understand is that we um, can address uh, when we talk about state, public states, uh, transversal issues uh, such as norms or other ones and this makes us possible to uh, get results for the sector and another important thing is that we got working groups and then we share common knowledge so every one of our uh, 85 members of the association uh, gives some time uh, and in our working groups. Um, I'm going to go a bit quick on the members of the association um, that, you can, uh, that you can see. This is the Machinery uh, College um, with uh, companies such as uh, ACO, uh, Kuhn, Pelinck, uh, as you know, France Pulvé, uh, this is it and also suppliers, uh, which are diverse, uh, the one you know, that SIG, IFM, and all the IDAC, uh, all the robotics one, but also new ones from the energy, for example, uh, Enedis and uh, Actia, and the electronics that was here right from the start. Then the research uh, college, which is uh, very wild, going from the uh, research in robotics uh, to the applied uh, agriculture, uh, institutes and then uh, the field one in the field one we've got cooperatives uh, Ceresia for example in grain crops uh, mainly and uh, sugar beds also Comité Champagne in wine we've also got close from Toulouse a cooperative a blue whale which is the leader the French leader in in um, in fruits export from uh, apple mainly uh, FNAMS uh, which is the seed sector and Kuma and uh, Sophie Proteol. Um, then you see our members solution. Uh, as you know, uh, we've got in the cattle breeding um, a very um, uh, good examples uh, ranging from uh, 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 Gentil to Kuhn to uh, Manurob uh, and going to the traditional uh, sector that you know in the vegetable uh, productions. Um, now I'm going to focus on our main results because we were founded uh, about uh, five years ago. Um, what was really important for us is that we got, for example, a call for tender um, for the machinery sector 
and we've got a 21 uh, million euros um, envelope for to test uh, what we call the prototypes or press array with the uh, uh, EU, uh, uh, EU uh, logo and the machinery directive uh, that can be tested in the field through uh, farmers, uh, uh, farms, and also institutes. So many of uh, some of our members uh, did benefit from this, and this was uh, our uh, initiative uh, because we did uh, make some proposal to the French state uh, uh, three years ago. Uh, then something very important that is very recent is that we did deal with the French state to be able to experiment um, some pu public, um, uh, certain public uh, roads uh, crossing, in fact, uh, with uh, an experiment, and uh, in a rural, uh, in the field, in the countryside mainly, and uh, it will, it will uh, make the sector evolve because, as you know, uh, at the moment when you have to cross um, a field, if it's separated by, by a small, uh, a small road, even if it's not, um, if there's any uh, traffic on it, you've got to put the robot on a on a tray and then uh, and lo lose many time. So this is very important for us. It's going to start, start the, this year. And the last one is what we call the Grand Défi, uh, Great Challenge of Robotic Agricole. Um, the state uh, did uh, ask us to make some proposal to get um, more, in five years, more uh, operational um, tools, uh, technology and machines for the farmers, as well as uh, setting up new uh, agroecological uh, it itineraries. So uh, the means is uh, mainly uh, mutualization uh, through common tools. Um, and um, Roland will talk about it more in details this afternoon. And I can see he's having a look at me. I did a six minute presentation. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you, Stéphane. And uh, yes, it's true that uh, we're going to have time uh, during the discussion at the end of the day to discuss a little bit more about uh, Grand Challenge. So uh, you have to stay here up to the discussions because we have a long day with a lot of amazing uh, pitch. And uh, we will have uh, four sessions uh, to discuss about uh, accessible robotics for agricultural transitions. Uh, one uh, about uh, low tech, uh, high tech, and uh, low cost. One about uh, robot 2x interactions. The so third one uh, will talk about safety, and the last one will be devoted to integration of robotic farms. So uh, let's start uh, with the uh, first sessions, uh, talking about uh, untitled from high and complex uh, tech cost, robust, and simple low cost solutions. And we start with a remote presentation from uh, Sala Soukarie. Uh, in uh, live from uh, Sydney. Salah, I hope it's not too late for you. Can you hear me? Hello, can you see me? Hi, Salah. Yes. Hello, how are you? Thank you. I'm sorry about that, a bit of delay there. So it's up to you, Salah. Uh, thank you very much to join us, and uh, please go ahead. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And I do apologize uh, for not being there. I wish I could be there. It's the beginning of our academic season and uh, everything gets very busy uh, at the university. I'll just uh, share my screen and hopefully, uh, can you see that? Yes. Yes, it's perfect, Sarah. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, the organizers asked me to kind of uh, present uh, the series of activities that we had been uh, working on in our lab at the University of Sydney, uh, focusing mainly on small bots uh, for small farms. Um, however, we were able to kind of extend what happens when you have multiple robots, multiple small robots working on, on larger farms. But the general idea was being able to use various types of technologies and research into different algorithms and sensors that allows us to miniaturize uh, the technology and uh, the robotics and, and be able to use on farms. So I'm gonna talk, a, it's a very broad um, presentation that hopefully we'll talk about the lab work, some of the STEM work, 
what we do with emerging developing technologies and also uh, in commercialization. Um, what I hope uh, that you'll get from this uh, presentation in terms of the general themes is what we consider to be the key research areas and what we're doing next. Um, and hopefully that caters uh, for the researchers uh, out there in terms of um, our interaction. Uh, I'll touch a little bit on the operational and then the commercial opportunities. So what happened um, in terms of putting these things out into the field and then and the commercialization process and some of the opportunities and challenges are there. Um, then I'm gonna take a slight detour and talk a little bit about um, what it means to kind of start to focus on small robotics for 90% of the farmers. So um, those that are in developing and emerging countries um, and can our technology, whatever we build as a collective community, can our technology support those? And as a final touch around that about the social license and the socio-techno sustainability elements. Uh, you know, we're working with technology, all of us, uh, but we're working with farmers and they're living within communities and, and there's aspects there around how that technology works and how we can bring the community on board. So um, I'll start by way of background. Um, my work started approximately 20 years in the lab, uh, 20 years ago, where we focused initially on drones. Um, and we built our own drones in the lab because you couldn't buy drones off the shelf uh, um, back then. Um, and our big focus was on environmental monitoring and being able to detect invasive species. And one of the key species was was weeds. So we used to fly a lot over farms and, and collect data and, and then determine um, uh, where the weeds were. Um, the reason why I show this is because uh, it was in around 2004, five when we started 2004, 2005, when we started drones, um, and about by the year about 2014, 15, so 10 years later, roughly, um, drones were a lot more off the shelf and were used by farmers. And so I think that aspect of understanding the research and the the temporal time, the time it takes to go out of that lab and what it means to build commercial activity and then get that scale is is important. And that's what we're starting to see in the ground robotics. But that was our first space and using drones and building drones to fly over large areas. The farmers would say to us that it was great that we could detect the weeds, um, but what could we do about the weeds? So we then shifted into uh, building ground robots um, um, to look at various forms. And we, we built a, a wide range of different ground robots. Uh, our big focus was electric um, and even solar electric, but we worked in everything from, uh, from grains uh, into horticulture, uh, in developing countries, small farmers. We even built robots for the cattle industry as well to to work around with animals and, and cows and, and things like that. So that was the, the general process. And we received funding from a, a number of lovely organizations in Australia, uh, research councils and, and and the farmer levy bodies. And they, they funded us to build this technology and, and be able to use it. Um, the approach that we took, so kind of looking at it a bit more from a scientific research perspective, um, uh, we being roboticists, our big focus was around autonomy and information modeling, decision theory. So you know, all those all those algorithms and those theories that you like to put behind in robotics. So our first call is to kind of speak to the farmers and understand the process that happens. And this is an example of a discussion that you would have, like for example, with a, with with apple growers, and they would tell us exactly each individual bit and and the steps that would go through um, in order to grow an apple over that season. What we wanted to do as roboticists is then delve a little bit deeper and understand a little bit more about what's actually happening in there, but to understand it from an information and a control perspective, because ultimately you want to build a robot to, or the sensing or the algorithms or whatever it might be to solve those problems. So then you you kind of, in this case here, again, looking at um, the steps within apple growing, so from pre-pruning and you kind of go around all the way through to packing, so everything that happens in between. And you ask the farmer every single thing that happens within those, so they tell you, and so you start to list all those down. And then uh, what you'll see is a list of all the Recording in progress. Uh, you'll, see, you'll see all the different uh, little elements that um, uh, uh, are in there in terms of what's happening. Uh, but fun, what I wanted to draw your attention to is anything that you see that's been in, that's bold, that's in a dark color, right? That's been bolded there. And there's two variables that we have after after everything. Um, the first variable is how much information they have about that particular area, and the second uh, piece of uh, variable is 
what impact does that information have on their decision making? So, for example, um, is it quality picking? They have reasonably good information and it has a high impact on decision making. But everything that's bold, so everything that you see in bold, has low information but high impact on decision making. So, assessing number of flowers, for example, or the quality size defects, as another example, or counting how many fruitlets there are. These are examples of where robotics will be able to come in and be able to develop solutions for that will have a dramatic impact on the operations because what you want to do is you want to st you want to move that low information to high information because you know it has high impact but generally speaking what you can see is anything that gives them information about the quality of the fruit flowers etc is important so we started off with a very simple we had a robot we had a four-wheel segway in the lab so we started to add many different sensors on there because as roboticists we didn't quite know what will work and what won't work. This was back in um, uh, 2011, somewhere around there. Um, so building kind of- you know, Recording stopped. And starting to collect all the information. This is one of the final results we have. So if you look at our YouTube videos, you'll see a number of different videos, but this is a mango orchard. Um, and in this work here, the, the objective is to count the number of mangoes that are on the fruit. Um, but you know, there's a certain, you wanna then be able to estimate the yield on each individual tree. So what you're seeing here is the color code. The color code is the robot or the algorithms identifying each individual tree. You're getting uh, an estimate of the volume of the tree. You're counting how many fruit there is that you can see, which is on the outside of the tree. And depending on that variety, you can then estimate how many fruit will be within the tree. So you start to get a density measure and from that be able to predict um, the yield on that individual tree. And we got some very, very accurate and, and um, results out of that. So that's just kind of, the th again, just showing you the thinking process about talking to the farmers, getting the models around information control all the way through to developing the solutions. And these solutions are, it's a number of different papers there that you can read up on that or on, on, that talk about those solutions. Did the same thing in the vegetable industry, um, being able to detect uh, individual, uh, uh, being able to not only detect individual plants, but understanding what the farmers want to see in each individual plant. That allowed us to build various different robots. Our first robot was Ladybird. Um, this is with the beginning of battery technology getting better. So around 2014, solar panels were becoming a little bit more efficient, about 18, 19% at the time. Um, and we didn't quite understand what the scope was within the vegetable industry. So we built a very generic uh, robot. Uh, that robot allowed us to uh, do things like such as change the wing span so that we could look at different size crops. Um, we could change the width of the robot uh, for different rows because no vegetable grower grows in the same type of rows. And we could also adjust the sensor pod and the arm pod for different types of crops. So that allowed us to build a range of different uh, types of, uh, oh, sorry, approach it to very different types of farms. So it's just an example of the um, of the of the robot um, uh, being a, a four wheel drive, four wheel steer. We did that on purpose so that we could maneuver around the headlands a little bit easier. Um, it's it's interesting the different types of uh, uh, um, uh, types of farmers and how they grow. So this is a very nice GPS level, a laser level than GPS uh, defined rows which meant that we could use GPS to kind of work down the, the rows. But having said that, as many of you I'm sure would know, as tractors go up and down, they affect the beds, they change the bed shape. So the robot still has to navigate along rows that may have changed um, uh, along the way. The uh, farmers the farmers then asked us, uh, could, we, could we then look at an, a more operational platform? Um, so what you saw before was Ladybird and the next version was Ripper. And so we saw that, again, the battery technology getting better. Our algorithms for guidance, navigation and control were getting better. The AI algorithms were getting better so we could start to use some deep learning techniques and, and apply them in real time. And we could start to build some novel mechatronic tools that could be used underneath the robot for, for different activities. So this is Ripper. It could operate on batteries alone for about 12 to 15 hours on a nice sunny day on you know many of our farms in Australia we can get that with the solar panels uh, we were getting very close to 24 hours um, the the power usage on this robot was approximately uh, maybe 270 280 watts of, of power required to drive it weighed at about 
250 kilos in total. Um, so that kind of gave us a, a, that, that power to weight ratio that we were looking for to move at approximately six to eight kilometers per hour and, and be able to do things on the farm. So we you know, bring all these concepts together uh, in that play. But the robot could navigate up and down the rows, even if they weren't GPS aligned. So you could find that um, the four wheel drive, four wheel steer again um, to allow us to move along the headlands. Real time AI techniques to detect individual plants. You've seen this before, but we're just using deep learning CNN techniques, the classic algorithms. We could start to build structure from motion and from that get yield estimation. Um, so that was those blue circles. And because you could identify the plant, you could identify where the weeds were. So we started to play with different mechatronic tools and started to look at what we could do. So this was the first example. This is about 2016 of, of trying to do some mechanical weeding uh, where we could detect the weeds and, and try and remove the weeds and just avoid the plants. So that was the general process. And here we had precision spraying. So as the system was moving along, um, you could actually do some precision vision spraying uh, along the way. Um, some, some important things, I'll probably just stop there just for a second, just so I can talk through some things. Um, the, the structure of the robot had to be built to allow for flexibility. Um, uh, you know, as you, as, you, as you know, as you're working up and down these rows, the wheels, because it's a small robot, if you make it too rigid, you start getting wheels picking up off the ground and, and moving out. So you have to have some flexibility. And so the way we built the robot the torsional aspects allowed for that flexibility. So there was no active suspension, but that allowed that, that process to stick the wheels to the ground, which was important. But if you did something like that, then you had a lot of movement underneath. Um, and that movement underneath meant that if you're doing real-time weeding or real-time spraying, you had to have some very, very accurate um, real-time tracking algorithms um, that you, um, you real-time tracking algorithms to be able to detect um, the individual bits, um, whether they're plants or anything like that. So the kind of pink that you see there is the system using um, some data fusion and tracking algorithms. So some carbon filtering and a bit more advanced to be able to track in each individual plant, build an estimate of so those black circles, an estimate around it, even while the robot is moving around and, and, and shifting around. The second thing is, um, depending on the shape of the robot. So you can get a lot of airflow underneath this robot. So, you know, on, on a very open field, you get a lot of airflow coming through and the airflow will circulate. So if you're going to spray, it's one of those things that you need to take into account, right? So, and, and, and modeling that and being able to understand that. So that was some of the couple of other research areas that we had to tackle and understand in order to make, uh, to make this work. Um, we, uh, I showed you initially that we had some uh, 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 tree crop, activity um, and so what we looked at was how do you then make the robot work across both in all forms of horticulture so both vegetables and tree crops so it's the same robot here again we added a, um, a gps receiver on a bar um, obviously so that we can get um, we can get gps coverage of, of from the trees because you sometimes you get a lot of attenuation of the gps signal through the through the trees but because the, again as i mentioned before you get a lot of flexibility in the robot and also because of this stem moving around, so you, this GPS will move around, which tells you, which you know, makes the position and velocity solution move around as well of the robot. So anything that we wanted to do, which is on this box here, had to have its own relative localization. So what we we're interested in here is detecting individual apples and being able to spray individual apples, doing that in real time at about 50 hertz. Um, and so you had to have your own, and again, some tracking algorithms, carbon filtering techniques, et cetera, to be able to track uh, while the robot's moving around. So you'll see that here uh, coming through. All right, so you'll see that here where it's tracking individual apples. Um, and here you'll see, a, hopefully you'll see a little shooter and it's spraying each individual apple uh, in real time. Okay, while the, while the, and, and hopefully what you saw also there was just the, mo the vibration, right? So how the whole robot moves around and wobbles around. So this thing has to track relatively and be able to take with what to. Um, the, the question that we got asked is, you know, why, why do this? Why do we actually do something like that? And, and we didn't quite, um, we, we didn't quite um, know what was happening with the, um, we didn't know, quite know what was happening with the process about, um, farming and you know in the context of trying to understand the um, um, uh, the process about why but from a robotics perspective this was a novel thing for us to do to kind of explore what different techniques and approaches uh, were appropriate 
Um, and what we found out after when the farmers were looking at this was not so much that the it was interesting to kind of spray individual apples, but for fruit fly, it would be really important to spray individual leaves and leaves around apples and miss the apples. So if you can detect the apples, not spray the apples, but spray the foliage around it, certain chemicals you can keep things like fruit fly away. So it allows you to kind of minimize how much spraying um, is in, in, involved. So hopefully that gives you a capture of the research. Where, where are we going now with the research? I mean, you've seen images like this many times before, right? So the future of agriculture, um, digital, et cetera, et cetera, and, and those elements. From a research perspective, um, we're looking at more than just what does a robot do in this environment, but looking at the whole aspect of collective assets and, and what that comes together. And, and just if I can ex just explore with you a little bit about where our future research is going uh, in this space. If you look at the bottom, you've got this real asset and you're hearing a lot of talk now about digital twins, right? So the ability to kind of um, mimic what's happening on farm, but um, doing it in a digital manner. Um, and what we're seeing a lot more interest in is how both the farmer or maybe the agronomist can interact with autonomous assets in a co, in a kind of like a co-learning and a co-decision type of framework. So we're seeing this a lot in the manufacturing, we see this a lot in mining, um, and we're trying to push these boundaries into, into what happens in agriculture. So yes, while we're still trying to figure out how to make robots work, and that's kind of the key things now, there's still this discussion about, well, as this progresses, can you start to add a bit more agronomy and digitize the agronomy into the robot? And if you can, can you start to build up this co-learning environment? So there are certain qualities about a robot that can deliver sensing data and analytical data much better than a human, but a human has a much better has much better ability around systems understanding and bringing up bring in other concepts about the farm operation. So collectively, there's aspects there. But what has to sit in between is the ability to kind of build up these algorithms. But what you see between the real asset and the digital twin is this information flow and it becomes more and more abstract so from the sensors all the way through and likewise the action flow goes from high level decision making down to the individual action set so there's some research now going on between coupling machine learning and biophysical models so the models that represent plant growth and how you plant machine learning with that co-learning between the human and machine i mentioned that edge compute we've heard a lot about that but there's aspects now when assets start to come in there won't be a single asset by a single manufacturer. There's many different autonomous systems. How do they work together? So decentralization. And also more importantly, starting to couple in a bit more of that spatio-temporal modeling. And then on the action space, we want real time with limited compute. So computing power, we, you know, obviously out in the middle of nowhere, we want to be able to minimize the computing power, but we still need the real timeliness there. Harvesting aids instead of full autonomy around harvesting is another interesting area and starting to look at how um, optimization brings it together. So that's some of the, the future research that we, we're going through. So um, we had the opportunity to explore about what does it mean to really operationalize that, that, that activity and then also commercialize it. And again, for any researchers out there, a, for me personally, it was a, a very um, interesting uh, experience of learning a lot about that process, bit of, of commercialization, spinning out the technology, but then also the commercial elements that sit within that. So, you know, my, the ACFR sits, uh, my, my lab sits within the Faculty of Engineering at the university, and we received some funding from the VCs, from venture capitalists, as well as some grow bodies, to spin out a company called Agaris, and that allowed us to start to look at commercialization of that technology. What fed into that was in, even in our lab work, so even while we were doing research and we were getting funded in the university, we still did a lot of economic analysis. It was a very important element of our research because the farmers wanted that. So if part of our project work, we had economic consultants come in, we spoke to farmers, you start to understand where the costs are um, on a farm and you start to understand maybe which is the right commodity which, that you want to work in that, that for that particular type of technology and how that works. So, you know, it, for Australia, labour cost is very high. In horticulture, almost 70% of labour cost, uh, almost 70% of the cost is in labour, and we use a lot of casual um, employees. So it's a very, very high cost for the farmer. Um, and when you look at it and you break it down, there are two real key elements that could help a farmer. One was obviously we talked about weeding, but that's more of a pain point as opposed to a cost thing. But when the robot's doing weeding, it's doing a whole bunch of other things. It can do intelligent spraying. It can start to look at harvesting or aided harvesting, can look at crop and till, and, and that's the process that we went through. We built a, a, a robot, um, and you can see here, very different to the lab robot. Again, for anyone who's ever interested in commercialization, you start to think about the cost scenario. 
Um, so in this kind of structure, flat panels, metal, um, to try to look at an architecture that was very easy to change and modify on farm, but at the same time, not make it too modular. You make it too modular, the, the expenses start to come up again. So you can see it's a very different architecture, a lot more free open um, that needed to be developed in order to reduce the cost of the platform. This robot, for, if you ignore the batteries, um, was probably about 130, 120 kilograms. Um, and then depending on how many batteries you wanted to put on there, uh, we were only using about 230 watts of energy now um, in terms of what was capable, but you could generate 300 watts from the solar panels. They're becoming a lot more efficient. So you could start to see that the, the way you design and build was reducing the weight. The batteries and the solar panels were getting better, so your power to weight ratio was, was, was also increasing, which makes greater efficiency running for longer, et cetera, on farm. And the lightweight meant that you, you minimize soil compaction uh, as you're going through. Um, we had uh, one of the key requirements for making this as a small robot was to fit in the back of the ute. It just had to be able to roll up autonomously, sit on the back of the ute, you strap it down, you could move it from one paddock to another paddock, and that was a, an important process um, uh, that we went through. So just a couple of videos to kind of show um, uh, what was achievable. Um, towards the end um, of this, so we had a three-year program in that commercialization stint. Um, we could we could program many different robots to head out to different parts. They used GPS to follow the headlands, but we never used any GPS to follow rows. In fact, the robots would just use row following techniques uh, to follow rows because, again, as before, you couldn't get um, you don't, not all farms provided that accuracy around that. So we could start to build up on that on that framework. Um, uh, and then also you could start to, you know, so this is looking at um, uh, crop and till, so the ability to kind of do crop intelligence. So you'll see here, you know, doing this in real time, real time um, um, uh, weed detection. But more importantly, you could actually start to come along and, and, and really build this, this map of information of counting how many pieces of fruit or vegetables are out there, where the weed pressure was. Even the red circles that you see there, they're normal fruit, vegetables that weren't growing properly. Um, and so the system would automatically pick those up and you can start to look at the history um, of those and you can start to see uh, what the weed pressure was looking like and what the impact of the weed was. So that gave us a lot, lot of um, um, uh, uh, ammunition to kind of build up more and more around that crop, ill, crop and till. And this is just one of the weed solution tools that we looked at. So being able to kind of uh, detect individual weeds um, and, and be able to scrape when we need to scrape and kind of remove weeds as they were coming through. If the weeds were too close to the plants, the robot would ignore it. Um, that was defined by the farmer um, and, and what that would look like. So that would kind of gave us the ability to kind of minimize the soil uh, disruption as well. Um, it, it's a, it was a, just a case conclusion on that. We had three years on that. It was a hard game to play because a, a hardware startups are, are difficult and, and finding the investment to kind of scale is hard. So you, know, you applaud all the companies that you see now um, at, your, at the workshop and, and, and at the conference that you're at, you applaud them because it's a quite a difficult process and for them to stay engaged over that period um, is, is very important. So the third thing that I wanted to talk about was um, just how we started to look at it for developing countries. Um, we started to look at making the robot even smaller. So what you see here is a little robot that we call the die wheel. All the smarts, the intelligence, the electronics and everything sat in the wheels and the wheels and we designed them in a way so they had some nice mechanism internally that made them stay, kept them vertical. Um, and, and that allowed you to do things like easily roll up a wheel into the back of the ute easily configure it and put it together and start to demonstrate what would happen if you had a really low cost robot. So this was now, you know, we're getting down to the, the 50 kilogram mark and, and it's much slighter, much smaller, much easier to move around. Could you do things like real time crop and tell? What, what if you added a tool to the back of it, et cetera? So how do we kind of uh, bring those things together? We had the opportunity funded through the government to, to explore what it would be like to test that technology out um, in Indonesia. We went to a, a, an, um, an area called Bandung where there's a lot of agriculture uh, in Indonesia. Um, and initially as roboticists, you kind of sit down and say, well, what would they, why would they care? You know, about robotics is too advanced technology and they're more small subsistence farmers. But you find exactly the same problem. It doesn't matter who you speak to, around any of the, where we were in the Asia Pacific region, um, you have the same issues, it's just different economics, but there are labor shortages, people don't wanna work on farm, people wanna go into the city, um, there are pests and diseases, climate change has a big impact, it's affecting the plants and the plant growth. 
Um, there's limited understanding of the type of chemicals to use to minimize that. So this is, these are areas where both robotics and AI um, will, will significantly help. Um, and the biggest challenge with any of these places was operational logistics. You know, how do you how do you move through these environments, through these towns, and, um, and being able to kind of shift the robot around and and, and deal with it was was, was very important. It's just a short video uh, showing the kind of activity. Um, so off to Jakarta, then drive to Bangdung, uh, start to piece the robot together, and start to demonstrate um, what can be done um, in there. And, and and I'll just pause it at a certain location. What was uh, what you see here is the die wheel. So this is a it's a small farm, but still quite advanced, right? They're starting to use plastic sheeting, but the farms around here weren't. Um, but again, the die wheel easy to configure. About 15 minutes, you can put it together, and it's got a selfie stick and it's got a mobile phone on it. And what we tried to explore was the capability of using a smartphone uh, for both your camera and your um, and your computational power. So trying to look at just off the shelf technology that can be easily bought um, in those areas. Um, uh, but what you what you got it was a, a the ability of a platform to move around. Um, it would wobble, but the selfie stick would keep the the the, the, the smartphone uh, vertical. So some very simple tools and and being able to kind of bring that bring that together. Um, the other thing that we we looked at, and I want to touch on this later, is trying to you know you have to work with the community and seeing what's out there. So this was like a little robotics electronic component store not far from the area. Because at the end of the day, you need to build up that sustainability. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about that one uh, later. Uh, but some of the farmers asked to look for adding some tools. So the same robot platform here, um, uh, using vision system to guide along the row. There were April tags that were added at the end of the row. So when the robot recognized that, it would know when to turn and come back. So very simple, low cost guidance, navigation and control. But what you could do with the smartphone is you could start to do, pick up and, and we wrote algorithms that just sat on the smartphone that could detect individual plants. And you could click on the app that we wrote and then you could kind of get some yield estimation uh, from there as well. And you could add tools like this is a spray rig on the back and the smartphone would talk to spray would identify when to turn it on and when to turn it off. So I guess the process that we're looking at was low cost, off the shelf, but you could start to really do some advanced techniques in there. They asked us for a much more modular robot. So as the farm, you know, the, the, that robot that I showed you before was good for really small farms, but if you had slightly bigger farms, um, then, you know, having a slightly different configuration, and you can kind of see here, it, it, it takes on a bit more of a form for more battery life. Um, and we, again, we had the opportunity to go to both Fiji and Samoa to test um, that new technology out. Um, and explore that. But what I wanted to just, if I stop for a second here and just look at it, the, you can see here what we focused on in taking the robot to those developing countries, those emerging countries, to kind of understand how we could use them on farm. Even though the technology, we were reducing the cost, we were making it smarter, and there was off-the-shelf items, the activities that we had to do were beyond the technology. So they wanted the, the government wanted us to focus on three things, just being able to talk to the farmers, demonstrate the technology, show that it works. Under thing two was around understanding the education in that country and understanding how you might build a training module. And three and three was then around looking at the economic modeling and sustainability strategy. So even as an engineer and as a roboticist, you have to branch out a little bit to understand those metrics uh, to see how best to bring that technology in and, and in what form. We were able to work with a number of different farmers, uh, sorry, partners, sorry, to get that, which was very, very important, especially in those developing countries. I understand the cultural context, the social context, the environmental, um, sorry, the economic context. So just some photos of, of the activity and, and the robot. Um, and I've got a, a video, but again, logistics, we want to build the robot so it fits just inside a standard crate. It can be shipped around. Um, obviously, uh, a big issue, as you can see in this top left-hand corner, is around biosecurity. You're moving it from one farm to one farm. So literally toothbrush, brush, whatever, scrape the wheels, clean it all up. Um, and what you see in the bottom right-hand corner is the ability to kind of just lengthen, you know, shrink and lengthen the robot using just some rollers and casters in that process. Uh, so this is just a, a video of, of that um, in, in action. This was in Fiji. Um, a very beautiful place uh, to be at and to kind of do these trials. So you're very fortunate to kind of uh, uh, look at how that technology might work. And working alongside farmers that, you know, are still using horse and, and plow, for example, to kind of uh, to till the land and soil the land. But as you can see here, the, the objective is to be able to move a robot very easily around some rugged terrain in different areas um, and being able to um, uh, 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 
move it and easily easily take it off the farm. Um, so you'll see here very soon, it was just a winch mechanism. You didn't need all these people, but it's just a winch and the winch would just, you just winch the robot down. Again, just keeping the technology simple to, to allow it to kind of work on different farms as you're going through. And what they wanted us to demonstrate was spraying, uh, being able to detect individual plants um, and, and, and weeding as well. Uh, along the way, so it proved to be a very good success, a great success. Um, and then even extending that out to look at tree crops, like we said before, you know, to being able to hear what you see here is the ability to kind of detect individual fruit, and at the same time the nozzles moving according to what the fruit density is. But doing it in a very simple one, just a three-point hitch that we could automate, and you kind of just do something very, very simple um, in that in that way. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about was just around that social license, socio-technical sustainability. Um, we we had this opportunity funded by the Australian government to look at what it would mean to bring agricultural robots into schools to be part of the curriculum so that you were trying to bring the younger generation back to farming. And I know for many people in the audience, you, you've worked with robotic solutions or AI solutions, and you understand the differences between talking to a farmer who might be 60 years old and explaining what the technology has to do and how they would operate the technology versus a farmer that would be 25 years old who might be very used to the technology. And, and, and that's a challenge for us because you have to build different user interfaces, different styles, different mechanisms, et cetera. And not every farmer can afford to bring a computer scientist or a technician onto their farm to, to operate these things. So one of the things that we were looking at was how do you bring the next generation of growers straight in from, from, from high school, from the secondary school, all the way through into, into the farming side. So we, we basically gave a robot to a school for six months um, and we had 20 schools and we had four robots. So every, you know, it was spread over a number of years and we we're just moving these robots around between different schools. And we gave the robot to the, to the children and straight away, we, we, you know, within the space of six weeks, they were learning about GPS, machine learning techniques, AI, how to code the robot, how to build 3D printing tools for, for you know, 3D printer tools for the robot to be able to use it on the farm. And we also, and I'm happy to share this with you, we also built a study guide. It's an 80 page study guide, which talks about robots and agriculture and how they come together and allowed the students to be actually learn and the teachers as well uh, to learn about it. And, that, and what we noticed straight away is a three year program. The number of kids who, the number of children, sorry, who then took on science-based subjects in their in their later years within within the within the, the secondary school, and then who decided that agriculture was probably now a career that they wanted to take on because of the AI tech scenario. So it's building that up, and that's not just a, a process in Australia. We saw the same thing in 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 the developing countries as well, and that was a big drive from the from the government agencies as well to kind of look at how they could encourage the younger generation to be part of um, that process of ag tech and and building up that sustainability profile. So my, my last slide is just looking at various aspects um, that I wanted to just talk about um, with regards to that and, and what that might look like. Um, when you're trying to look at developing countries and STEM, a lot of it probably has to be open source. And there's a lot of things that are happening now that I think will change the way we do agri-tech, um, especially in developing emerging countries, but also in developed countries that I can't see it being any other way. Um, you know, a lot of cheaper phones are coming out, opens, um, opening up the software that allows you to then be able to do things such as real-time machine learning techniques, which are also open source, um, 3D printing that's also open. So um, being able to use different types of CNC machines, but also designs that are coming out. And something that I think is quite important is looking at the local context of the countries that you're in. And for example, this here is looking at the two wheel electric scooter market and how it's growing um, over there, because that could form the basis for both the building and sustainability um, and maintenance of future agri-tech systems, right? Platforms, just being able to take a scooter, pull it apart and repurpose it into the structure, for example, of, a, of an ag robot. And when you've got these other machine learning techniques on the side, then I think it becomes quite interesting. So last slide, I hope that uh, presents um, um, an overview of what we've done in the lab and where we've gone. And I hope we've touched on the research and some of the operational commercial challenges and opportunities we faced as well as what we've been trying to do with the uh, uh, with both the developing and the emerging countries. So thank you for your time. And, and if there's time for questions, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Salah, for your impressive talks. <laughs> okay. 
I don't know if you can hear the people from the attendees uh, clapping their hand. Um, uh, we have time for a couple of questions, I guess. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, Jorgo can uh, join me on, uh, on the, the scene. Uh, does anybody have some questions? It's a bit complicated because we have a huge uh, room. So while you are thinking, I have one. You talk about the assessments. Uh, do you also assess the acceptability for the farmers and the future users of the robots? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it was important to understand um, the um, element of what we can do with regards to um, uh, uh, bringing the technology onto farm, uh, what they need in terms of that support structure, and then post-analysis, uh, looking at how they use the robot, which is important as well. So what are the main elements that they, they used it for? Um, but I think more importantly before, uh, the key criteria that we found was the the sustainability had to be from the grassroots. So we had to get the younger generation involved in order to allow those metrics to kind of continue over, you know, three, five years that we could measure. Okay. Uh, don't be shy in the room. Uh, there is uh, about uh, more than 100 people, but don't be shy. And we have microphone. If you have to ask questions, just uh, uh, put your hands up. We are with the microphone. <laughs> yes. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'd love if you could touch on how do you uh, think about the, the cost and lowering the cost? Because if you think about emerging countries and being able to, to buy a fairly significant uh, robot that replaces fairly cheap labor. Uh, how do you think about that, and how do you plan around it? Yeah, I, I think it's. Uh, I think there's two parts to that. One is one is how do you how do you reduce the how do you reduce the cost using um, what's available there um, on on farms, what's available within that community. So as I mentioned before, um, you know anything from being able to work with the local um, scooter maintenance place where you can you know get very very cheap parts for building these technologies that's on that's on one side but the other side is the economic model the business model or whatever it might be that you have to do to interact with the um, so you're, you're absolutely right labor is cheap but they're finding it hard to get labor so it's the same problems that you'd have anywhere else but it's just different economics so you have to not only reduce the cost but the type of model that you want to introduce and what we found in in the asia pacific region was a service model so a consultant of some form uh, that would service different types of just uh, different farmers would allow the reduction of the cost to the farmer themselves so a bit more of a service. so you wouldn't be selling these robots you'd be training up individuals that will run the robots on the farms for individual farmers and then there's two ways that we saw could potentially work uh, one was uh, they get a fee for doing whatever they're doing, weeding or crop until, et cetera, or they become part of the farming process. So they get a percentage of the yield, you know, in terms of the sales at the end of it all. So there was those two different models that we saw potentially developing in, in those in those countries. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, but we have uh, to keep on working with the program. Thank you so much again, uh, Salah, for your impressive talk. Thank you. And so now we will switch to uh, Jorge uh, Villes. Uh, is he here? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, he will talk about crop week, visual perception, and its application uh, in agricultural task. Uh, he's coming from the Exim and the University of uh, Limoges, so from France. Please go ahead. You have to push here. Uh, to go back. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jorge Aviles, and I'm a PhD candidate with the Exlim Laboratory. Here you can see the members of the robotics, of the agricultural robotics of the laboratory. And um, for today's presentation, I'm going to talk about crop wheat visual perception and its application in autonomous tasks. 
Before going into details, I would like to talk about the problem statement, the problem that we are trying to solve. Did you know that each year about 40% of production, of food production is lost due to pests? And there are different factors that are perturbing this problem. On the one hand, we have abiotic problems, abiotic factors, which are temperature, weather, irradiation, and nutrients. On the other hand, we have biotic problems, biotic factors. Inside this category, we have three different groups. The first one is the animal pest, then pathogens, and finally, weeds. In general, for example, for pathogens, we have some factors like bacteria, viruses, and for weeds, we have different kind of weeds that perturb crops. In order to mitigate weeds, we are using around 3.5 million tons of pesticides in order to, to mitigate this problem. And as you can imagine, with pesticides, we can improve crop qualities, crop quality. However, also we can directly or indirectly polluted soil, water, air, and in general, the ecosystem. By the way, the, here in France, right now there is a, a study on the impact of the ecosystems, here as you can see on the slide. And for this reason, the French government creates the Ross Challenge. The Ross Challenge aims to organize different evaluation campaigns in order to measure the progress of each solution. And what's the problem or what's the task to be solved? General, in general, we have three different tasks. The first one is crop weed detection, then weeding task, and finally, the global intervention. The global intervention, in other words, we have detection, decision, and action. And here to the left, you can see a typical parcel, the typical problem that we are working on. We have plant of interest and weeds. And of course, we have to delete weeds. Here you can, you can see two different distances. The first one corresponds to the inter-rank distance and the intra-rank distance. The problem, the, the plant of interest, we have two different plants of interest. The first one is maize, which is sowed in straight lines, two straight lines, with an intra-row distance between 15 and 30 centimeters. And for beans, we have three straight lines, which were sowed between 8 and 15 centimeters. In the competition, we participate four different projects with the same conditions, with the same problem. However, each team proposes a different solution. We are the PID project, and in general, we propose, three of the teams propose a mechanical weeding, and the other one, as the name says, propose a electrical weeding. The, the road challenge was coordinated by the National Metrology and Testing Laboratory and by the INRAE in, in Montaul. This a, a town here in France. Here you can see some of the images with the referees of the competition. And that's the context, that's the general problem that we are trying to solve. Now, to talk about the solution, the proposed approach, this is the solution that we propose. We are, the team is formed by three different projects, the three different sub-teams. The first one is Carbon B. We are Exlim Laboratory and Saviagri. And the proposed approach consists in a mechanical, in autonomous mechanical weeding. We are using this experimental platform, as you can see on the image. And we developed a um, perception system, which is formed by a camera, a leader, a time of flight camera, and inertial central. We are using all this information in order to extract different information to carry out the weeding task. 
In general, of course, there are a lot of problems to be solved, but we can highlight three of them. First, we have to solve crop detection, after autonomous navigation, and finally, autonomous weeding. For the crop detection, on the bottom left, you can see the general scheme of the proposed approach. We have two subsystems. The first one performs the autonomous navigation in blue, and the second one performs the autonomous weeding. Both of them are using the same perception system and the same algorithm to estimate the plant of interest. We propose an algorithm to detect physical characteristics, and we are not using the typical artificial intelligence that's most of the world that we have nowadays. For this, we evaluate the plant of interest, like in this image you can see for maize, during the different growth stages. As you can see, the plant possesses different characteristics according to the growing stage, and we exploit this information. For example, color, the size of the plant, the number of leaves, and we are using all this information. Oops. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, we test different indices in order to highlight vegetation, as you can see top right. Once that we separate vegetation from background, we are using a, trans a different color space transformation from RGB to HSV. This is because it's more robust against different illumination and that's the case that we have in the experimental case. And after we use thresholding solutions in order to filter the plants of interest and crops. Finally, we are using morphological operations to estimate the coordinates of the plants of interest. Here you can see an example. At the top, we have ABCD, which corresponds with the original image the indices, the transformation after thresholding, and the final result. Here I have a video. This, you can see, it's for the proximal detection, which is located under the platform. We are, we are able to estimate just maize, which correspond with the plant of interest. And there are some widths that, of course, they are not detected because the proposed approach is focused just in plant of interest. And what happened with the frontal detection? These are the results that we obtain for the frontal detection. As structure moves, we are perceiving different plants, and we are able to estimate to isolate only the plant of interest. This is for the case of the frontal detection. Now that the problem of crop detection is solved, the next, step, the next step is how we can exploit this information. We are with the same general scheme, but right now we are with subsystem number one, which consists in autonomous navigation. And the proposed approach that we are using in this work is called vanishing point trajectory correction but what vanishing point is. First, once that we obtain the different coordinates, we have to estimate the lines for each one of the parcels. As you remember, as I explained at the beginning, for maize, we have two straight lines, and for bean, three. And we obtain each line for one crop line, and after, when a set of parallel lines are projected on the image, they can meet in a point. This point is called vanishing point. So, first of all, the step number one, we are initializing the lines. First, then, we are clustering each one of the detected plant of interest. After, based on a linear least squared solution, we are estimated each one of these lines. 
Finally, we have the parameters of each one of these lines to be used with an, the same and base, linear base, linear square solution, linear least square solution. But you can imagine that, for example, in the case of maize, we have two linear, two, two a system of equations which is formed by two lines. In general, we can use any algebra, algebraic, algebraic system to solve this problem. But what happened with being, with, we have three lines. Maybe there, are, there is not a solution in this case. That's the reason why we propose a problem based on linear least square. And finally, we are using a visual servoing technique in order to correct the trajectory of the platform. The goal is to estimate the vanishing point, as you can see here in green. And as the platform moves, the green point has to remain on the image center in order to correct the trajectory of the platform. And here are some of the results that we obtain. Then the first subsystem is complete with detection and autonomous navigation. Finally, we have the autonomous weeding. For the autonomous weeding, it's subsystem number two in green. And as you can see, the, we, are, we are gonna use the same detection system for both cases, for navigation and for the weeding tool. Apparently, there are two different systems. However, they are operating with the same detection algorithm and they are operating simultaneously. And what's the proposed approach to solve the weeding, the weeding task? First of all, we propose a mechanical weeding. And as we are able to detect corrupted crops, in this case, maize and bean, we have to protect these plants. For this, we, on the image, we create an on-off decision, as you can see in the figure. As the platform moves, crops and weeds are projected on the image. And when a crop is detected on the decision zone, the weeding tool is deactivated in order to protect and eliminate everything that not correspond with a plant of interest. Here on the left, you can see, we call a protection zone. This protection zone it's defined in order to avoid damage crops. And once a uh, weed is detected, we activate the weeding tool in order to eliminate weeds. And finally, we propose our system in another international competition. It is called ACRO competition. The idea is the same that in the Rose Challenge, we have the same characteristics. However, the main difference is for the autonomous navigation task. As you remember, in the first case, we test our system just in one parcel. It was maize or bean. For this competition, the autonomous navigation was completely different because first of all, we consider four different parcels they correspond with the same crops and weeds. However, for the second part, the parcels were modified. We start with a maize parcel. After there is a transition zone to continue with a bean crop parcel, we have to half turn in order to continue with the navigation. And as you can see, the parcel was modified, not completely straight lines, in order to test the capacity of the, proposed, or the, the proposed approach. And for this time, we use a different platform. As you can see, it's an Ackerman configuration. We are using the same perception systems, the frontal and the proximal detection system. And here are a video of the autonomous navigation. And of course, this is a real agricultural experimental field where we have a lot of challenge situations like we don't have control on the illumination systems and the kind of soil of course is different. 
And finally, these are the uh, obtained results with our respective zoom in order to visualize the orientation of the platform. And, and that's all. <laughs> if you have questions, go ahead. Was really finished. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, is there any question uh, in the room? So uh, do not hesitate to put your hands up and uh, say hello. Uh, I have one question uh, regarding the detection. Uh, if we imagine that we have several kind of um, of crops, uh, can you still working on these different kind of crops? Imagine you have one rank of maize and one rank of uh, uh, other species, you can adapt that? Uh, yeah, for the moment, the algorithm is able to detect only maize and bean. However, as I present on the image, we, are, we evaluate the physical characteristic of each plant in order to obtain the parameters to integrate to the algorithm. Uh, hello. I have a specific question uh, relating the uh, electrical reading. Have you studied how it uh, affects the mycorrhizal uh, uh, population in soil, the, the microbiome around the rooting system, when we use electricity to, to uh, take uh, weeds off? Uh, we didn't use electrical weeding. I showed, I showed you that one of the teams that participate in the road challenge use an electrical weeding. Our proposition was a mechanical weeding. Of course, we can substitute our mechanical weeding by um, electrical weeding in order to compare the results and the ad adverse effects, as you mentioned. But for the moment, we are using just a uh, mechanical weeding. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. Nice talk. You focused on visual perception, but the platform also had a LiDAR and a time-of-flight camera on board. What was the role of those sensors? Yeah, the, we, as I mentioned, we have different captors, but for the moment we are using all, in this talk, I present the results that we are consider only the RGB camera. Of course, we are integrated in also different information as time-of-flight, but for this talk, I present only these results. Yeah. Yes. Ah. Uh, first, because as I mentioned, we are participated in a, in this competition. So according to the characteristics of the crops to be detected, we propose the solution. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> it will be time to, uh, to go on to the next uh, presentation, so thanks again. Okay. And now we will switch to uh, Ricardo. Uh, we come from uh, Politecnico di Milano. So sorry for my uh, Italian accent, it's uh, even worse than my bad uh, English accent. And, uh, you can uh, talk about method for uh, domain adaptation in wheel crop visual segmentation. So it's okay you have... Uh, yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Please go away. Okay. Good morning to everyone. I'm uh, Riccardo Bertoglio, and today I will present a study about uh, methods for domain adaptation in crop and weed visual semantic segmentation. So if you, if you don't know what is domain adaptation and semantic segmentation, I will go deep uh, in a moment. But first, uh, let me say two words about me. I'm part of the Artificial Intelligence and Robotics Laboratory of the Politecnico di Milano in Milan, Italy, 
and my research interest is the application of digital technologies to agriculture. So which digital technologies? Machine learning, uh, image uh, analysis, computer vision, and robotics. So what is uh, semantic segmentation? So it's the task of assigning to each pixel uh, of an image uh, a class from a set of classes. So in the case of agriculture, for example, if you have an image uh, taken on a bean uh, field, we want to assign the classes, for example, weed and crop, to, like Jorge uh, showed us, to, for example, destroy the weeds. And what is domain adaptation? So let's be pragmatic, okay? Then if you want, uh, I can give you uh, the paper with all the mathematical formulas with probability theory. They speak about alignment of the marginal distribution and so on. But now we want to build a robot, okay? A within robot. So we, we need to go in the field to collect some images, okay? Because we want to train a deep learning model. Okay, we probably need a camera. Deep learning model, they usually perform well in the task of semantic segmentation to detect the weeds. So the first year we go in the field, we collect the images, and then we need to label these images. Okay, but the, this process will take some months and it will cost uh, a little bit, maybe some thousands euro. And so for year one now it's ended and we need to wait uh, the next year. Okay, but now we have trained our model with the, with the labels. And so in the year two, we go in the field, we have our robot, our uh, deep learning model, and uh, wow, we are lucky. Uh, more or less uh, the plants are of the same age, more or less the lighting condition uh, are the same. And so we apply our deep learning model and we get, uh, wow, a really good performance. Okay, so now we are excited excited and we want to try our model the next year after, okay? And again, we go in the field, but well, this year uh, there was a little bit uh, more of rain than usual, and so now the plants are higher, also the weeds, uh, and they are bigger. We apply our deep learning model and, well, we are disappointed. We have very bad performance. So now, what can we do? We can again label our new images, but uh, we know it takes some time, some money, so maybe we can think uh, something smarter. And here it comes domain adaptation. So ad domain adaptation is to adapt our deep learning model that was trained on the source, okay, source uh, data set or source domain to uh, maintain the same good performance on a target domain of which we do not have labels. And in domain adaptation, uh, we speak about source domain, and then we have a related, but not, of course, uh, uh, completely uh, equal target domain. So our objective of, of the study was to investigate uh, domain uh, adaptation techniques uh, to maintain good performance in different domain shifts. Okay, the domain shifts, it's the, the difference of the source and target domain or data sets. So what are the possible domain shifts in agriculture? So for example, you have uh, different robots and different cameras. If you train uh, your deep learning model on the first robot and camera setting, and then you test on the second robot, it will, you will have a degrad degradation of performance. This is a possible uh, domain shift. A second one, and uh, okay, in our case, <laughs> we, we also had names for the robots. The first is Bibip, and the second is Widelec from the Acre competition. And then another domain shift is, for example, different here. Of course, if you have a within robot with a deep learning model, you want to apply into uh, different years, as I told you before. And then there are other different domain shifts, for example, different fields or different geographical areas. 
Okay, but in our case, we just study these two kinds of shifts. So the images that we use in our study came from the uh, rows and matrix project, okay, where uh, in particular in the rows project, four uh, robots participated, and they have names. In, in particular, we chose the BBIP and we the like images because they were they were the most similar, and. The Rosen Matrix project are agricultural robot uh, evaluation campaigns in which we evaluate the performance of robots in different tasks like autonomous navigation, autonomous weeding, and so on. But if you want to know more, I invite you to join the today's uh, scientific session, session four and um, pitch number three in particular. So. Uh, okay, domain adaptation, uh, it's a very broad field. There are different kind of techniques. And in our case, we studied uh, uh, input level techniques. So we, mo we modified the input image of the deep learning model with style transfer techniques. So we wanted the source images to, visually, to be visually similar to, of the, uh, to the target images. And in particular, we exploited two techniques that I will explain better in a moment, but now we see some characteristics of these techniques. So we have the first is the amplitude swap of the Fourier transform. So it's a pretty low-tech technique. It's, it's fast. Uh, it mainly has uh, one hyperparameter to, to tune. And also, it only requires the training of a single fully convolutional segmentation network. And then we tried the adversarial based uh, status transfer through the cycle gun architecture. It's a more complex technique. The, the training takes way longer. It has many hyperparameters, but it's more powerful. So it's a trade off. So what is the uh, amplitude of the um, amplitude swap of the Fourier transform? Well, maybe you know the Fourier transform. It's a mathematical tool to transform each periodic function into uh, a, an infinite sum of sinusoids in the domain of frequencies. Okay, so uh, you can apply the Fourier transform to different signals and of course also to images. If you apply uh, the Fourier transform, then of each of these sinusoid uh, components, okay, you can get the amplitude and the phase. And why we are interested to divide the input signal into amplitude and phase? Because we, we know that the phase of the Fourier transform of an image carries the semantic. The amplitude carries the style. So for example, here we see the source image, a, a, a urban street with cars and uh, day, with daylight. And then we have uh, another target image with in another street, but it's darker. And so now we want to apply the style of the, the target image on the source image. And so since the amplitude carries the style, we do a swap. We swap part of the amplitude of the source image with part of the amplitude of the target. And so we get this on the right as a result. You see the semantic is the same. We have the same street of the source image, the same red car, the cars here, the, the trees. But it's not daylight anymore, but it's darker. So it has the style of the target. OK. And this is beta, the only in the single hyperparameter that I was talking about. So you need to decide how much of the amplitude you want to swap. Because if you then you take usually you take the low frequency components. If the beta gets bigger, then the style transf the, the style transfer will be stronger, but you will introduce artifacts. So it's a trade-off. And then, as I told you, we tried a more complex technique, the cycle gun architecture. So in this case, we want again do style transfer, but with uh, generative adversarial train networks. Uh, for example, here uh, we want to transform a source real image 
of zebras into horses, that is our target domain. And so we use uh, generators and discriminators. So the generator learns to transform zebras into horses and the discriminators needs to understand uh, if this is a fake or real image. Then we have a real image of horses and the discriminator wants to understand if this is fake or real. Then, uh, well, generative uh, networks, uh, generators, maybe are a little bit creative sometimes, okay? That sometimes uh, it's nice as a feature, but not always. So what if, uh, like the generators, instead of two, starts from two ze zebras and then puts here like three horses or four horses? Well, in the case of weeds uh, or in crops, uh, it's not really good if we have different number of uh, crops, plants, that have been generated. And so the author of this study, of CycleGun, put another generator here to transform the horses back to zebras. And then they use the loss from the, to check the difference between the real image and the reconstructed. So if there are now four horses, they got translated into four zebras, and then you will be penalized by that loss on the top. So now we have solved like the big problems, but still uh, it's not enough. Because maybe this generator can transform like grass into water, maybe like a lake, and then this generator learns to transform the, the water back into grass. So there is not really semantic consistency. Okay, we were talking before of semantic cementation, assigning class to pixels. There is no a preservation of the class of each pixel. It's not guaranteed. So this is the uh, actually half of the cycle architecture because then you also have, uh, I mean, it's a mirror then you also have horses translated to, into zebras and to, um, and to horses again. So, so here, oops, I don't know what I did, a mess. So here it's like uh, the full architecture. So in the middle, uh, maybe it's a little bit complicated, but it's like two times the, the thing that I showed you before in the, in the previous slide. And this is applied to the agricultural use case. So here you start from a real image of crops and you translate it in your, so from source to target domain. You see in this case a change of color of the background of, of the soil. Okay. And then you translate this back into the source domain to have the cycle consistency that I was talking before. But uh, as I said, this was not enough, okay? So the author of this study added this uh, uh, loss IOU, not on the images, but on the predictions. So to maintain the semantics, you want that the prediction of the translated image is the same as the prediction of the real image. To further enforce the semantic pre uh, preservation, we added another loss. So it gets even more complicated. <laughs> so beyond the IU losses, we also added this phase loss, but to the images. So in this case, we come back to the concept of the Fourier transform. Before, we exploited the amplitude to the style transfer. In this case, as I said before, the amplitude was carrying the, the style and the phase was carrying the semantic. And this is what we want to do in this case. We want to exploit the fact that the phase carries the semantic and so if we compute the phase of the real image and of the reconstructed, of the reconstructed image, the phase difference should be minimized. This is what we wanted to do with this phase loss. So basically, we had these domain adaptation methods that we tested, and now we, need, we wanted to compare them to see how they perform. 
and so we needed an experimental framework. So we started to train a baseline. The baseline is to train, as I told you before, to train your deep learning model on source images and then directly test on the target images with, uh, without doing nothing. And usually it performs badly because the target images are a little bit different than the source ones. So now we want to exploit our domain adaptation model. So we take the source images, we transform our deep, the domain adaptation model, we put them into input of a deep learning model, and now again we test it on target images, and we hope the performance will improve. And then we have an upper bound. So the upper bound is directly train and testing our deep learning model on the target images. So in our case, we, we, we are in a scenario in which we do not have actually the labels of the target, because as, as I said before, it's expensive, the labeling, but for the purpose of our study, we put in this scenario, okay, which we add them to see how it would be performed if we would have the labels. So here are the quantitative results. So on the bottom, uh, on, the, um, on the top, we have a table where we, we tested the domain shift between different robots, okay? These were BBP and Widlek. We had bean and maize uh, plants. And we see the baseline, for example, the first row, 0 0.74. The upper bound is 0 0.87. So there is uh, a degradation of performance. And so then we have these, our three uh, domain adaptation methods. The first, as I told you, was the Fourier transform. Then we have the SIGAN with the uh, IO loss. And then the uh, cycle GAN architecture with the additional phase loss. And it turns out that the cycle GAN architecture with the additional phase loss it actually helped a lot to improve the performance uh, compared to the baseline. At least uh, in the first scenario where we tested domain adaptation between different robots. Okay, in this scenario, like in the bottom table of different years, well, uh, we did not perform really well, actually, sometimes really badly. And in this case, uh, the baseline was actually the best we could do. We do not only have quantitative results, but also qualitative, because as I told you, uh, we uh, exploited the style transfer techniques, and so we transformed source images in the style of target. You see here, you see here then the transformations. Okay, especially look at the soil, how it gets transformed into the style of the target. And you see that uh, the models perform pretty well. In some cases, still the semantic preservation is not guaranteed. In this case, this plant has been completely cancelled out by this uh, model. So here, all the pixels are not more cropped, but they became background. And this was the beep beep with the legs of the different robots uh, scenario, and then we Oops, again, I did the mess. And then we have the different years scenario. And in this case, as uh, we already seen from the quantitative results, uh, uh, it didn't go really well. The Fourier transform introduced artifacts in the images, and the cycle gun architectures perform, actually, visually, they seem nice images, but uh, uh, sometimes, again, uh, there are some pixels that maybe they should be background and they became crop or, or weeds or so there is, there is some mess. So the conclusion, uh, so there exist actually uh, successful uh, domain adaptation techniques to maintain good performance without ne the need of labeling new images, okay, but they do not perform well in all scenarios. 
There are also low tech techniques uh, like the Fourier transform, which uh, only has uh, one uh, hyperparameter to tune and it's really fast to use. And uh, generative based solutions are more complex, complex uh, but they are also uh, more powerful. But they have many hyperparameters to train and the learning is unstable. And finally, there is, there is no really fully automatic solution. So even the Fourier transform, you need to tweak that uh, bit of parameters maybe, and then you don't have really ground truth uh, label data in the, in the real use case. So you need to look at your images if they visually resemble the source images. So we are still far from a fully complete uh, solution. So if you want to check the paper, here are the details, the QR code with the links. Thank you for your attention. I'm not, I'm not really good at answering questions when I'm on the stage, so don't ask me difficult questions, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. We won't have time for a lot of questions. But while uh, Hussein is coming uh, on um, here, uh, I have uh, just a quick question. Uh, why are you not choosing uh, all the data that you collect to, um, to design a kind of uh, simulator or a digital twin in order to after change the possible the variety of lightning condition and so on and make the learning on these digital twins? Is it possible, do you think? Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Now you have a lot of data, so uh, you can use it to uh, design a simulation tool or a digital twin. Yes. yes. Uh, do you think it's possible to do that and make the training on the digital twin? What do you mean exactly with digital twin? Uh, <laughs> uh, simulation software, in fact. Okay, so from the images uh, we have collected, you want to be like uh, a simulated environment? Yeah, such as gazebo or... Okay, like on gazebo and so on, and then uh, you want to... Change the lighting condition in this uh, virtual world. Uh, ah, okay. Yes, or you could seen. do it, but uh, I'm not sure that uh, the simulated uh, conditions that... Uh, then they can really resemble the, the actual condition that you can find uh, in the field. So, uh, yes, indeed, uh, domain adaptation usually is used in this scenario. You start it with uh, synthetic data, and then you apply on the real uh, images, on the real data, and you see they perform really poorly. <laughs> so, actually, training on the simulated scenario usually is not will not give really uh, really good results on the, in the real scenario. Okay, I understand. So thank you again. <laughs> no. and, uh, thank you. And we're going to switch uh, now to the last talk of uh, this first session, which uh, will be given by uh, Hussein Shweib Arik uh, from the DBO, so Norway. And uh, it will talk about uh, leader follower approaches in uh, robotics. Thank you very much. Uh, it will be nice to have my presentation. Yeah. Uh, my name is Shai Parik. I'm a researcher at uh, Nibio. Uh, so, uh, Nibio is the Norwegian Institute for Bioeconomy. So, from the name, so it's located in Norway. We are divided in uh, five divisions. And I'm uh, working partly on the division of, of uh, food production and society. Um, we have different locations all over Norway. So I'm part of the biggest uh, field trials and the biggest station in, uh, in Norway, which is located around two hours northern of Oslo. Uh, and I'm as well part of the Center for Precision uh, Agriculture, where we have uh, as a mission to contribute to research efficient and sustainable agriculture and actually be the main contact for the farmers to shorten the time span from the research result to something that we can use actually in uh, real uh, life. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the re leader follower approach for the navigation inside the field. But uh, I think it's uh, really important to give kind of a background on why we want to do this. 
So this work is actually part of uh, a project that is called uh, Solar Farm, which is mainly the idea of actually using uh, electricity generated on farms in order to replace the fossil fuel-based tractors and as well using data collected from aerial vehicles in order to actually have uh, precision fertilization to reduce the, uh, the inputs, on the, the, inputs on, the, on the fields. And as well there is like the part of the system analysis is to mainly how to uh, actually apply this to uh, Norwegian conditions in the weight of the slides that are coming back soon, hopefully. Oh, I, I can see my screen here, so, but I think it's more important that you see it. Well, I was trying to uh, make the presentation shorter, but it doesn't help if uh, there is no presentation at all. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, just two things that are we consider as low-hanging fruits is that like the things that we consider that are easier to uh, to achieve on this project is like to first develop the fleet management system is to allow the replacement of heavy diesel-based tractor. Uh, to the use of smaller electrical vehicles. And the second one is to improve the nitrogen um, use efficiency by using the data that we collect from the drones and then like apply the fertilizers where uh, they are needed. So I want to explain more or less the workflow, how we actually proceed. So the first thing is that like as the, any research in agriculture, so we have the field trials and then we collect the data from the field trials using uh, hyperspectral and multispectral uh, in, um, uh, cameras. So we are using like uh, the Ricola camera which is equipped with the hyperspectral uh, or the, the S1000 DJI which is uh, equipped with the hyperspectral camera and we are using as well like the Phantom uh, for multispectral uh, um, drone. What we do as well like we have uh, the handheld uh, nitrogen sensor that we have like closer uh, uh, data collection from the fields. But then like the next step is to have the ground truthing because no matter how fancy the drones that you're using, satellites whatsoever, if you don't know the actual information that you have on the field to actually compare the data that you get from the drones with the actual physical pro properties of the, the, of the field, it de doesn't, uh, doesn't make sense. So that's why we actually collect the data and we geotag where we collect the data and then like we include this with the modeling in order to have the best estimation uh, on our uh, on our models. So this is as, as well like just a short explanation of the path from the data collection and the modeling that we have using uh, some random tree forests to uh, estimate the end concentration. We estimate as well like other parameters as the yield and uh, uh, yeah, the end uptake and so on. And then like we use this to create the recommendation maps. It means that like here we can, what you can see is that like where we want the nitrogen to be applied inside the field. So the stripes are just like to uh, illustrate the, the usual um, mainly used today is like to apply uniform on the whole field and then like the other, the other parts are where we actually want to have like kind of uh, precision uh, fertilization. Sorry. And then after that, of course, we need to take the data and do something with it inside the field. But then like the problem that we face is that like the uh, sprayers that you buy today, uh, like the most advanced are section controlled. That mean like you control five nozzles at a time. But we want to uh, get as high precise as possible. And that is why we actually developed our own precision sprayer with garden hoses and everything, but it was working fine in the first prototype before we took it like a bit, uh, a bit, uh, a bit uh, advanced. So what you can see here is the, the, bench, pro, the, bench test, uh, the test bench that we created in order to calibrate each nozzle. And the nozzles here are something that we can actually control uh, 
the output of the liquid. So we can uh, control how much liquid is coming outside from uh, from uh, from the nozzles. And I particularly really like uh, the image because this is not the idea when I said I'm working on agriculture. Uh, so we're uh, developed like the drivers to control the, these nozzles, uh, and then like what we do is that we have the GPS position of the tractor, and then we have the heading of the tractor, and of course we can just translate to the 25 uh, nozzles that are on the back, and then like we read the map and then apply uh, the fertilizer uh, while driving. So this is just like a test uh, that we have performed on the asphalt before we drove on the field, because it's easier to show on the asphalt that we can actually control each nozzle individually, and then we can control the uh, the amount that is uh, coming outside of the of the nozzles. But then, of course, like spraying the fertilizer on the leaves is not the most efficient way to actually give the nitrogen to the to the plants. But it's just like to show that we can do this. But the the idea is to use like kind of hoses that actually uh, spray the the fertilizer directly to the to as close as uh, possible to the roots of the plants. But then, like, the next part is actually to develop this multi-field vehicle navigation. So what we want to achieve, uh, actually, is to control, to design the control and communication system that allows a tractor that is manned, someone is sitting inside the tractor, to actually uh, double the width, the working width, while uh, having, like, a robot, one robot or multiple uh, robots that, that are driving at the same time. So what we actually begin with is that we have developed the motion controller. The motion controller is the, what sh the thing that allows actually the robot to move inside the field. And then like we tested the operation in the vehicles and the team. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have like some time to just talk a bit about the charging station that we uh, have created as well. So when it comes to the motion control, so without going into much details, what we want to do is actually to allow the robot to go from point A to point B. That's as simple as this. Because like if we want the robot to be able to follow the tractor, it needs actually to first move in a straight line from uh, one point to, to the other one. And then like in addition to this, make that the robot is able to talk to the tractor while uh, inside the field. So actually to be able to move in a straight line inside the field, we need, ha we need to have a reliable pose estimation and we need, ha we need to have the motion controller. So just like to make it simple, the robot needs to move from uh, one place to the other one and then like needs as well like to turn uh, while, while driving. So that is why like the goal of our, uh, our motion controller is to regulate the angle that we have and this distance that we have to the waypoint. And the waypoint in this case is the, is the robot, uh, is, is the tractor. So this is, this is a real uh, video uh, where we actually was based on using like just the IMU and it's not reliable because then you can lose the heading of the, of the robot and that is why we needed a more, more robust heading estimation. The heading is just like to make the robot know which direction it is in space. And that is why we added like a dual uh, RTK GNSS receiver. So RTK stands for real-time kinematics and GNSS is the global navigation satellite system. Uh, it's just like to uh, say fancy words for something that is we are precise localizing the robot inside the field. And then like when having two uh, sensors, so like the distance between the two sensors gives us actually the ability, or we know the distance between the two sensors, so we can actually estimate the headings based on these two sensors. And this is the most robust way to actually uh, have the head, having the heading inside the, inside the field. The other thing is like to tune the, the controller and this is just like to show that we are uh, testing like the static control uh, waypoint following and tuning the control to make the robot actually uh, drive to where we want it to drive. But the main thing is that like we want to have uh, the field navigation and to do this the scheme is just as simple as that we have the tractor running in one line and then like moving to the other row and then the robot is always like keeping the predefined distance and angle to the, to the tractor. So this is the example that of the field uh, trials or the experiment that we uh, conducted inside the field. Uh, what we can see here is that we have, uh, I don't know if I can launch the video from here, no. Can you click, please click on start on the video or something? Yeah. 
Thank you. So what we've done here is that like we have, um, this is an electrical tractor, looks really old. It's uh, based on the Ford 91, I think, chassis, but it's electrical. So what we've done is just like we created like kind of a box with, with an empty, empty computer run ROS, and then like we equipped the tractor with the GNSS uh, RTK uh, receiver and an IMU. And then like we have uh, an access point that is located on the tractor. So the robot is connected to the access point, so we have long range Wi-Fi on the robot. And then the tractor is broadcasting the position all the time to the robot. And the robot is taking this time, uh, uh, this position as a reference point. And then like what we do is that like we wanted to test mainly how the robot and uh, the estimation, uh, pose estimation is reacting when driving inside the field because like it's not a, it's not a flat surface. So we have a lot of, uh, especially like here, it was after the harvesting season. So we have like a lot of, uh, a lot of ditches and a lot of uh, irregularities inside the field. And then like this affects mainly because like um, the reference point that we get from the tractor is based on the GPS position and the heading of the tractor. So like the, if the tractor is tilted and so on, so the, posi the point is moving as well. But um, we got like relatively good, good results that we are uh, more or less happy with. Uh, this is just like to show more or less like the puppy uh, style that uh, the robot is following the uh, tractor. Uh, but then like of course we want to test this uh, in the next stage in uh, real conditions where we want to apply the fertilizer inside the field with both the tractor and the uh, robot. But the main idea that we wanted to achieve here is that like we have a completely autonomous system. It means that if we have like kind of a fleet of vehicles and then like one of them wants to recharge its batteries, we don't need that the farmer go down from the tractor and then like take the robot back to the charging station and then plug the cable. So we want to think that like we have kind of complete autonomous system. So the robot drives back autonomously to the charging place, to the garage, and then like park inside, and then like we have a mobile charging station that is doing what the human will do. Take a cable and plug it inside the, inside the robot. So the first phase is actually to allow the robot to navigate back to the charging station. If you can help me with clicking the play video, please. So here what we have is that like the robot is uh, using uh, GPS to or the GNSS signal to navigate all the way back to, um, to the garage. And then like we have as well like communication between the garage and the infrastructure. The infrastructure here is as simple as the garage door. So it's just like uh, sending, the robot is sending a signal to the garage door telling now you need to open the door. So when it arrives there, it tells just the garage now you need to open the door, the door is open. And then like once the door is open, the robot will start moving inside the garage. But then like we're moving from outside where we have like reliable GPS navigation, uh, GPS signal in an inside where we don't have reliable GPS signal. And that is why we have as simple as an R tag that is used as a target. So the robot is just now switching from GPS to camera and then looking at this R tag as uh, where it needs to follow. And of course the robot has as well like a LiDAR in the front in, for like more, more security. So, uh, so this is like the part that moving from outside to the inside and once we are inside, so the robot as well is uh, connected to the server asking this charging station, now I'm inside, you need to plug the cable so I can charge my, uh, so I can charge my batteries, sorry, and um, thank you. Um, so this is my last, uh, last part. So what we've done here, uh, if you can help me as well uh, with clicking the play button. Thank you. So the idea is that we, don't, we didn't want to have like one charging station per vehicle and we wanted to have like kind of a mobile charging station for everything. So each, each uh, all the vehicles that are parked inside will have like one mobile station. So this is uh, an omnidirectional platform and this is a universal robot arm. And then we are using as well like the same as uh, a tag that uh, ad identify where the, the plug is. And then the, the robot arm uh, equipped with this camera will see where the, the, the cable is and then like go and plug it here. Here you can see that we have like uh, this blinking red, it means that something is going on in progress. 
but we have communication between these two, so between the, the robot and the mobile charging station. So once the robot arm successfully plug the cable inside, it will tell the robot now unplugged, you can start charging, and then like the light changes, and then like when the robot is done, so it will just like tell the uh, mobile charging station, now no, I'm done, you can uh, unplug the cable, and then the uh, robotic uh, mobile um, charging station will just like do the thing again. But I just like it's just to simulate, but at the same time, while waiting, it can do the same thing for other, uh, other platform, platforms. So uh, this is mainly what I was uh, going to present. I thank you for your uh, attention, and I think I will be here, so if you want to ask some questions so we don't take time from the poster session. So, n'hésitez pas à poser vos questions en français aussi. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, as uh, we are running out of time, maybe I suggest that uh, people ask a question during the coffee break. Uh, that uh, will be uh, in the, the other building. So you have to go across uh, the little space to have a coffee. And during the coffee, there is a poster session. So do not hesitate uh, to drink a coffee and uh, look at the poster. And uh, we will get back to uh, 10.40 in order to have time to uh, look at the poster. Thank you very much and uh, see you soon for the second session.